Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 27th of September and boy, this is a big one because we just had Ignite. So in this weekly update, I'm actually going to try and cover all of the infrastructure related updates that were announced at Ignite 2020 and there were a lot of them. Um, as always, if this is useful, please give me a like, subscribe, comment and share. But first, before I get to the technical things, super quickly, once a year, uh, I try and do some kind of event for charity. And I want to do this to cure childhood cancer. And so what I'm going to do is a virtual Ironman in two weeks on the 10th of October. It will be 2.4 mile run, 112 mile bike ride actually on the Kona course using uh, my Wahoo virtual setup, so it will incline, decline, the resistance increases, I'll actually be riding the course, and then a 26.2 mile run. So this will all be tracked, so if you can, um, please donate a very, very worthwhile charity. If you can't totally get it, maybe you just spread the word. So this week, new videos, uh, I released part three of my Azure Masterclass, Governance, all things around policy and tagging and management, all of that stuff, it's about an hour and a quarter long. And then kind of a, a deep dive around Azure Data Box and what the complete flow looks like. So we had Ignite. The book of news is phenomenal. So if you didn't see it, go to this link, it goes through all of the news that was announced, links to deeper articles, um, some videos, just a really, really good resource. Again, I'm gonna try and cover a lot of the infrastructure related things. There's just so much, I can't cover everything, but I'm gonna try and cover the main things, but definitely um, worth a look. So let's start with compute. So these new um, DDV4 and DDSV4 series virtual machines uh, these are built on the Cascade Lake Intel architecture. So these are the Xeons 802072CLs. Um, the D, so if you get kind of the version without the D, it means there's no local storage. So ordinarily we get that kind of temporary drive that's high performance, low latency, using storage on the actual host running our VM. Well, the non-D variant doesn't have that local storage, so it's cheaper. So we now have these available. Azure Dedicated Host actually had a, a number of announcements. Remember, Azure Dedicated Host is that idea of ordinarily, we can think about in Azure, there are these physical boxes. And when I provision a virtual machine, well, my VM gets placed on one of those boxes, but someone from another tenant may be on the same box as me. Now, there's hypervisor level separation, virtual networks, there's not a real danger that they can go and do anything. But in some circumstances, maybe regulatory, I'm not allowed to share hosts with people that are not my company. And so what Azure Dedicated Host does, it essentially lets me purchase a host. It's dedicated for me. So a buyer host of a certain size, a certain SKU, it supports D series or F series or something, and that's mine. And I can then fill it up with virtual machines. And what's kind of been announced is now, well, firstly, we can have host groups. So I can now think about actually creating a host group. And I can say how many fault domains I want. So I want two fault domains. And then I can add dedicated hosts into that host group. So now when I deploy, I can say, hey, I want to deploy this VM. Remember, I can fill up these hosts. And I want to deploy it to the host group. And then it can go and distribute them out. So it simplifies the provisioning. Um, as I add the host groups, I say which fault domain I want them to be in. So we have this great new host group deployment capability. Also VMSS, so virtual machine scale sets. Now I can deploy a virtual machine scale set. Remember a VMSS is essentially I have a, a template based image, some configuration, a minimum maximum number of instances, and it will go and deploy it for me. So I can say, hey, deploy this now to my host group, and it will spread them out over those fault domains for me. VMSS is awesome when I just have 10 instances of the same thing, 
and it can do that auto scale for me as well. And host maintenance operations control. So because it's just me on those hosts, I can actually now set, well, when I want maintenance to occur. I can tell it, hey, here's my maintenance window. That's when you perform fabric level changes. I, these hosts, they still have to be maintained. They're maintained by Azure. And so they have to reboot to a new image with the latest patches on. I can now set maintenance windows. I can also do that for isolated virtual machines. That's where I create a VM and it fills up the entire box. So no one else is even on that box. It's just me. So now we have this more granular control of kind of those host maintenance operations. Private link managed disk import export. So this is a cool feature. If you think about managed disks, what we typically had in the past was, well, I had a storage account. So I had my storage account. And then disks are essentially just page blobs. With managed disk, it abstracted away the storage account. I didn't see it anymore. What I see is a managed disk. Although what's happening behind the scenes is it's still a page blob on a storage account, but I don't see it. If I do an import export operation, the way it works is it would generate a shared access signature for a limited time. And through that shared access signature, I could essentially access that storage account so I could import disks into Azure or bring them out. What it's now going to let me do with this shared access signature, it will actually support integrating with a virtual network using a private link endpoint. So now I'll only be able to use that import export through a particular virtual network. So now I've got that private link integration with the import export for my managed disks. Ultradisk support for 512E. So this is really all about, ordinarily, an Ultradisk is a 4K physical sector size. Well, sometimes that doesn't work with more legacy workloads. If I think it's Oracle 12.2 and below, maybe below 12.2, it doesn't support 4K. So now with this Ultradisk option, I can go and say, hey, I want 512E support, and it will now work for those legacy workloads. We also now have premium disk performance tiers in preview. So this is all about the idea that ordinarily, if I think about my kind of premium disk, I have a certain capacity, I have a certain number of IOPS, and I have kind of a throughput. And it scales linearly. So I can think about, well, a P10 has a certain capacity and a certain IOPS, a certain throughput. Um, a P30 has a different one, a P50, another one again. So I'd have to increase the size to get the higher IOPS, the higher throughput. Now what I can actually do, I think it's once every 24 hours, I can actually change the performance tier of my disk without changing the capacity of the disk. So I can say, hey, P10, I actually want you to appear as a P50 now. So I'd get the IOPS and the throughput of a P50, but it's still a P10 capacity. Now I'm going to pay for the P50 price. Maybe I've got some workload to do when I'm finished. I can take that away and go back to the P10 performance and go back to paying the P10 price. So that's now I've got this option for performance tiers of my premium disks. Azure Spot VMs now show historical price and the chance of eviction. Remember, the point of Spot VMs is Azure has a whole bunch of capacity. And many times there's spare capacity. So rather than it sitting there just spare, Azure sells it to you at a greatly reduced price. And I can basically put in a bid. I can say, hey, I'm willing to pay up to this amount of money. Maybe I've got workloads that don't have to run 24 seven. Maybe it's a batch job I wanna run. I wanna do it as cheaply as possible. So now what's actually gonna happen is, when I go and use those spot virtual machines, if I go, for example, and look at a virtual machine, I'm gonna add a new virtual machine. And what we can see, if we scroll down a little bit. So here we can see this Azure spot instance option. So if I change this and say, yes, 
I've got this view pricing history and compare prices in nearby regions. So it's actually going to show me, hey, the region I've selected, um, East U US 2 and Canada Central. And down the bottom here, you can also see it's showing me eviction rates. So 10 to 15 percent. So it's really going to help me decide, hey, uh, which one should I use? Which one's going to be a best fit for my particular workload? So we now have more insight into using those spot instances. The Azure VMware solution uh, has GA'd. So this is the idea that, hey, maybe I'm in a rush to get out my data center. I don't have time to actually move to Azure Resource Manager and Azure VMs. I want to carry on using my existing tools and skill sets. So I can actually have hosts running VMware in Azure. I think it's between three and 16 nodes make up a cluster. It's using hyperconverged, so it's using vSAN for storage replicated between the hosts, uh, my regular NSXT networking. And then I use things like ExpressRoute Global Reach to connect the networking used by those VMware instances to my on-premises network for management, um, for vMotion um, over into that solution. So this is kind of like the second version of this. This is now a Azure first party offering in partnership with VMware. So that has hit GA. Hybrid benefit for Red Hat Enterprise Linux and SUSE. So now I can actually take existing VMs in Azure that are using pay-as-you-go licensing. So I'm paying for that license and switch it over to using my existing licenses I've purchased. So I could think about, hey, I'm doing a POC. I'm using pay-as-you-go licensing in Azure at the moment. Then it's proven out. I'm going to go and use my existing licenses from on-prem. And it's very simple to kind of switch between. So now I have that hybrid benefit capability. Um, an Azure supported distribution, the flat car container Linux. This is an immutable um, Linux distribution. This is really replacing the core OS, which is now end of life. So this is very good for container scenarios. Uh, Azure auto manage. So this is all about the idea that, hey, I have VMs in Azure. And now with a click of a button, I'm going to say, hey, Azure, do best practices for me. Go and load it into Azure Security Center. Um, use best practice design state configuration to configure it. Um, set it up for patching. Set it up for backup. So it's going to go and do all of those things for me. And I can say, is it production or development? So it will use the right kind of configurations, but it's really kind of a, a click and forget to go and set up now my virtual machines for best practices management through Azure. Uh, integrated Windows Admin Center. So Windows Admin Center is this great agentless tool that I can install on a, my local machine in a gateway scenario. And just using WinRM gives me full management of my server operating systems. Now what I can do once I've signed up for this, Windows Admin Center will actually show up under settings for each VM. I can click it and get full Windows Admin Center of control through the Azure portal to my Azure VM. Now today, the VM needs a public IP address. I have to open up certain ports, uh, NSG rules to make this work. I mean, that's going to change over time. But now an Azure integrated Windows Admin Center. And as part of that, it gives me kind of an RDP capability or to those VMs as well. VMSS custom maintenance. So now I can actually set a window. I think four hours is the minimum, six is the recommendation. But I can set a recurring window for if I'm using the automated um, image update capability. This could be from a gallery image or a custom image. I can say, hey, look, if there's a new version of that image, automatically roll it out to my virtual machine scale set, never more than 20% at a time. Now, what this allows me to do is set a window of when that should occur. So, hey, between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m., it's quiet. That's when you can go and take down 20% of the environment to redeploy it based on the updated version of the image from the gallery or my shared image gallery if it's a, a custom image. New region, West US 3. Um, Arizona has been announced. So this is all, again, based on minimal environmental impact. Actually, I think this is all about water and actually giving water back um, to the region. 
more regions supporting availability zones. So I think this is Canada Central and Australia East, but more and more ability for you to have access to these cooling and power and communications independent facilities within a region. So it's really given me isolation from any kind of facility level failure. So more regions now supporting. You can always see these. If you actually go and look at the region article, it shows you a list of all the regions. But if you actually scroll down, it shows you um, if it's actually got availability zones are available. So you see it's availability zones presence. So over here, and it shows me, hey, there's three zones. You, you should never see more less than three zones. So again, these are logical to your subscription. And it, it's always three. Um, so these I go and select for my subscription. Hey, put this in AZ1, this in AZ2, this in AZ3. A different subscription, they're mapped differently. My AZ1 might be a different subscription's AZ3 or nothing at all. They might be completely isolated. But for my subscription, I'll see three AZs, which are these cooling, power, communications, independent facilities uh, within that region. So we have that there. ASR to availability zones in the same region. So remember Azure Site Recovery is the ability to replicate VMs to other regions in Azure or from on-premises to Azure. Now what I can actually do if my VM is actually in an availability zone, I can now use ASR to actually replicate to a different availability zone in the same region. So it's now an option in the replication. If it's in an AZ today, then I can replicate to a different AZ using Azure Site Recovery. And the Azure Kubernetes service has got some updates. Uh, firstly, stop, start. So ordinarily, if I think about Kubernetes, the whole point of AKS is you can think about, well, there's the management components. So with AKS, I don't really see or pay for the management part. That, that's really part of the Azure, that control plane. Um, the API scheduler, the NCD database, et cetera, et cetera. What I pay are for the worker nodes. And by default, I have kind of this system node pool. And it actually runs a, a few core services like DNS and some other things. And I can have multiple instances of that. I can also have user pools. So these are not running any system components. So what I could do today, user node pools, I could scale down to zero. But I can never scale this to zero. So I'm always paying for at least one node. What this new functionality is going to let me do is actually stop the AKS cluster. So this will get deprovisioned and I, I stop paying for the compute side. When I start it back up again, it will put it back to the state it was when I did the stop in terms of number of instances, et cetera. So it will bring it back. So that's really nice capability to kind of really uh, optimize my cost, especially test dev. Now I can actually go and stop my AKS cluster without losing all my configuration. When I start it again, it's gonna bring me back to where I was. So that's really the key feature yesterday if I had deployed additional node pools, these users, I could scale it to zero to stop paying. But that system pool with my components in it, like if I go and look at Kubernetes services, for example, if I just go and look at one of these, if we look at services and ingress, we'll see a bunch of cube system processes kind of there in the center. So if I just go over here, you see these. So because of those, I could never scale to zero. We, we have to have those things there. So what this is going to let me do is actually stop, stop paying for the thing, and then I'll kind of come back when I start it again. Azure AD RBAC. So I can kind of do this today. Today I can take Azure AD identities, um, map them over to Kubernetes roles, run some commands, and then they'll work and then do it for a different cluster. What this is actually doing, it's just fully integrated. Um, so if I actually go back to that same cluster I was just on, if I look at my access control and look at my roles, we'll actually see these new RBAC roles. And we can see this idea that, hey, if I go up here, we see these RBAC admin, RBAC cluster admin, RBAC reader, and RBAC writer. 
And if I just quickly looked at one of those, and we looked at the permissions, we can see now for the container service, what we're gonna have is data plane. So we have the management at the top that we're kind of used to, but now we have these data plane, all of these various permissions here. So now I could set this at like a resource group, for example, and it will actually get inherited down through the various Kubernetes clusters, etc. So it's just a much better way to actually go and get access and do that large scale ball based access control for my Kubernetes clusters. And Azure policy. Um, so this replaced kind of the old pod policy stuff there was. This integrates with Gatekeeper. It's designed to once again be as essentially managed policy for my Kubernetes. For example, hey, no privileged containers. I can do various things. It's giving me that central management and insight uh, into AKS. Disk bursting for DSV3 and ESV3. So this is the idea that virtual machines have a certain amount of IOPS and throughput. Well, for small windows of time, I can actually burst beyond those. So these two SKUs now support bursting of the VM level IOPS and throughput. Networking. So um, Azure VWAN has the idea of the hub and what they enabled was, for example, Barracuda could deploy their virtual appliance actually into the hub network to make it easier to integrate for routing with uh, maybe edge locations, branch offices that had Barracuda appliances. Well, now Cisco have the same capability. So the Cisco SD-WAN can have their appliance deployed into the hub of the Azure Virtual WAN to make it easier to integrate um, Cisco branch offices and other locations into that all up SD-WAN infrastructure. Azure Global Load Balancer um, now, this is in public preview. This is the idea that ordinarily the Azure Load Balancer, this is a regional construct. So I can think about in Azure, I have a certain region and I have an Azure Load Balancer. So it's layer four and it has a public IP and it has a number of backend set members that are things in that region, VMs, VM scale sets, AKS nodes, pods, whatever that might be. Well, now I've got another region, so we call this region two. It also has a different Azure Load Balancer, which has a different public IP, because again, it, it's within the region. It's pointing to other stuff. Well, now I can have a global load balancer that actually points to region level load balancers. This is Anycast. So if I think about the Azure, all the edge locations it has, this now has a public, so again, it's public IP today only. It's a different public IP. So now the client, wherever that client may be, this is any cast that's available from multiple points around the world. The client talks to this, and this global load balancer will redirect them to the closest one to where the client is actually located. Uh, because this is layer four, I can do things like uh, maintain the client IP address. So that client IP address will be passed all the way through back to these backend services saying, I don't get to do things like Azure Front Door. Now this doesn't replace Azure Front Door. Remember, Azure Front Door is a layer seven solution, but it only works for HTTP, HTTPS. So if my workload is HTTP, HTTPS, I would carry on using Front Door. That's gonna give me caching, SSL offload. It goes and grabs big chunks of data and serves it up um, in little pieces to the client that's close to it. It terminates the connection, so it's a near connection. Great, but if it's not HTTP, HTTPS, if it's something else, well now I can use this global load balancer. Traffic manager is still there as well, but traffic manager is DNS based. That's gonna resolve the name to something based on performance, rollover, whatever you might want to do. This is a new solution, um, layer four, but again, must be public IPs today. Storage, I talked about this last week, um, but they announced it kind of this week. Essentially now on blobs, I have a last access attribute. So if I read from it, it's gonna update that attribute. This might be useful for third party solutions, 
that want to know that data, but also the Azure Lifecycle Management can now use Last Accessed in addition to Last Modified. So Lifecycle Management is all about, hey, I have different tiers, hot, cool, archive, and I can set rules to move it between those tiers or now based on the access time, not just modified time. There's now point in time restore for block blobs. This actually uses three features. Uh, there's change tracking, there's blob versioning, and there's soft delete. So for a combination of those three things, I can actually now roll back to previous point in time of block blobs. So hey, I wanna go back to how the block blob looked four days ago. So now uh, we can go and do that. Azure database, wow. Um, so I've talked about this before, serverless Cosmos DB. Ordinarily with Cosmos, I pre-provision a certain number of request units, RUs. And it's really a, I don't know if science is the right word, it's guessing a lot of the time, and then I have to tune it. So I might have a lot of wasted RUs that I'm paying for. It might be I don't have enough and I get certain error codes because I've exhausted and it's having to wait. What serverless lets me do is actually I pay for the RUs I'm using up, up to a limit. I can say, hey, I don't want to spend more than this, but it will only bill me for the RUs I'm actually using. So that's uh, an option there. Flexible server deployment for Postgres SQL and MySQL. So before for like Postgres, we had single instance um, and for MySQL. And the way this worked is it was essentially, think of it like a container. If something went wrong, it would spin up another one a couple of seconds and reconnect to the data. Then for Postgres, there's hyperscale, uh, Citus. That's multiple instances sharding the data out. Flexible server is a new option where once again, I'm kind of, I, I have my compute and my data separate, but I can now, if I play into availability zones, have a replica. So I can have an AZ resilient replica of my deployment. Additionally, if we actually go and look at this for a second, let's say we want to go and do a Postgres deployment. We'll do an add. You can see I've got my flexible server over here on the right. You'd also notice just below it, I have the arc enabled option as well. But if I hit create, one of the cool things that I can actually do, notice I can specify an availability zone, and I could also do a zone redundant if I wanted to. So it's giving me kind of those options over here for that zone redundant. Now, if I go to configure server, I have three options. I have burstable support. So my burstable is the B series virtual machines where I get maybe 10% of the processor. If I bank up credit, I can shoot up to 100% of the processor for the time until my credits run out. So that's really good for really cheap workloads that maybe you're only busy occasionally. Or I can use general purpose, I can use memory optimized, it will actually show me uh, the VM SKU is gonna use behind the scenes. I can separately ramp up the storage. So I have all these different kind of capabilities as integrated backup, and I can change this dynamically. So, hey, I need to change from the burst with general purpose, I need to burst up to a higher SKU. Um, I have those capabilities with this new flexible server option. So this is just a great another capability. So I have the optional replica to another AZ. Um, it uses a delegated subnet to integrate my virtual network. So it's not using private endpoints. The way this would actually work is if I think about my deployment, my deployment, I have, hey, I've got my virtual network. The way these flexible solutions work is it will actually take a delegated subnet and that's where it will kind of instantiate various IP addresses and then your workloads in other subnets will go and talk to those IPs. So that's how it gives me the private connectivity. It's actually using a delegate subnet. It's not using private endpoints. Private endpoints are used by the single um, kind of container instance solution of Postgres and MySQL. But for the flexible deployment, it's using VNet integration. Um, I can have custom maintenance windows. 
again, because it's kind of a dedicated instance to me, I can pick when it does those things, and it is stoppable. So once again, it's separating the compute from the storage, so I can actually stop the compute side and stop paying for the compute. I still pay for the storage, but I'm not paying the compute side of that anymore. Azure Arc, Azure Arc was everywhere in Ignite. Remember, Azure Arc is the idea about bringing the Azure management capabilities to services on premises, uh, to services in other clouds. Well, that Postgres SQL hyperscale and Azure SQL uh, managed instance, they're now public preview available on Azure Arc. So I'm using Azure Arc. Uh, I can go and use these data services now. Uh, for Azure SQL Database Premium Business Critical, there is now availability zone support. So those um, types have multiple instances replicating the data. Now those instances within region can be spread over multiple availability zones. And there's now Azure SQL Edge for IoT scenarios. This is like a 500 meg mini container designed to run in IoT scenarios, but it gives me the SQL engine um, for ARM and x64 based. Miscellaneous. So Azure Resource Mover is now available. So Azure Resource Mover is all about the idea that if I actually jump over for a second, if I go and look at, uh, let's look at my resource groups, and I'm just going to pick, it really doesn't matter what one, I'll pick a resource group. What I can do, if I select every resource, I then have this move option. So you can see over there in kind of the, the top right, let's go over and highlight that. So over here, I have this move option. And what it's gonna let me do is I can move to another resource group, move to another subscription. So what it will do is it will lock the resources and then move them to another resource group or another subscription. I also have the option to move to another region. So that's actually going to take the resources and completely move them to a different Azure region. Now, while it's doing the move to another resource group or subscription, it's locked but not frozen. So what that means is, well, I could actually still read and write to a SQL database, for example. But I, I can't change things about the actual Azure object. Now, not everything is supported for this. If I actually go and look at the Azure Resource Mover documentation, it talks about all the different types of resource that exist and goes through, well, look, um, does it support moving between resource groups, between regions? Let's go and find compute. So if we look at compute, here we can see, well, uh, scroll down to the bottom. So virtual machines, yes, they can move between resource group subscriptions and I can move them between subscriptions. Um, disk encryption sets, disk. So it's showing me all of the different resource groups, subscription options, for all of the different types of resource. For the region move, it's a much smaller list. And that's actually on the region move documentation um, actually goes into those details. So if you're curious about that, go and check out the docs. and It tells you which ones can move between regions, but it's, it's a much smaller list. Azure Arc, as I mentioned, <laughs> Azure Arc is really everywhere. And again, the point of Azure Arc is if you think what is Azure, Azure is kind of a, a cloud capability is things like role-based access control, it's things like Azure policy for governance, it's things like tagging. Then there's a whole set of services. Um, I have things like backup. I have things like update management. I have things like Defender. I have things like um, Sentinel. So there's all these different services, right? And so the point of Azure Arc is, hey, I have resources running on-prem. Hey, I'd like to kind of bring those capabilities on-prem. Hey, I'm using some other cloud. I'd like to bring my kind of capabilities to those as well. And it's really broken down into Arc for servers. So just managing my Windows and Linux boxes. Uh, Arc for Kubernetes, it will manage various distributions of Kubernetes, let it be managed through Azure Arc, um, and use GetOps. So it will actually point it to a GetOps repo and get the apps. And then once it's managing Kubernetes, it can bring data services by deploying them to 
that Kubernetes environment. So that's the, kind of the point of Azure Arc. So they GA'd Windows and Linux server management. So that's bringing all those capabilities, the change tracking, the patching, the backup, the monitoring, etc., to those. Still public preview is the Kubernetes management for Azure Arc, which powers data services. So again, now it's public preview, um, Postgres uh, SQL hyperscale, that's the multi-instance sharding the data, and SQL managed instance. Azure Backup Center, now in public preview. So Azure Backup Center is really the idea that, hey, I have multiple maybe recovery vaults, and what Backup Center lets me do is I can overall see my complete set of backup services. I could go and see kind of all of the various backup policies I have across vaults. I can centrally manage those things. I can also go and look, for example, at, well, hey, what resources maybe do I have that are not being managed? This is taking its time for some reason. <laughs> I'm going to wait for that. I can go and look at, hey, protect, protectable data sources and it will go and find me resource, in this case, virtual machines. But I could also change that, for example, to other types of resource. So it will find me things that, hey, you're not protecting right now, but hey, you, you probably should be. So I can leverage that to really centrally worry about all my backup stuff. And Azure Backup ZRS um, now is an option. So remember, Azure Backup, fundamentally uses Azure Storage. Ordinarily, it's either locally redundant and I can do a GRS to replicate it to another region. Well, now I can also do zone redundant. So the, the vault is actually spread over multiple availability zones within the region. AKS on Azure Stack, HCI. So Azure Stack is now kind of a, a set of solutions Azure Stack Hub was the original big turnkey appliance that we could purchase. Azure Stack Edge was kind of the original data box, kind of that edge compute, um, can have FPGAs and GPUs in them. HCI originally was kind of a combination of Hyper-V, Storage Spaces Direct, Windows Admin Center. Now HCI V2 is actually a dedicated OS. It's built on 2019, but it does have a tweaked hypervisor. It includes Storage Spaces Direct and other management components. I can actually now buy it as appliances from vendors or I can install it on my own compatible hardware. Well now, if I'm running Azure Stack HCI, once I'm using that Windows Admin Center, I actually see an AKS extension and I can click it and it will deploy AKS to my Azure Stack um, HCI deployment. So a couple of clicks and it will deploy AKS to my Azure Stack HCI instance. So this is really designed, hey, I've got on-premises, I've got maybe a smaller footprint, and I can be running Azure uh, consistent sets of services. There's now an Azure Advisor score. So if we jump over to Azure Advisor, Azure Advisor is great. It gives us guidance around things like, hey, reliability and cost and security, optimizing what I'm spending. Well, now it's gonna give me this score and that score, it's going to refresh every 24 hours. I can see on the right hand side, it's showing me how I'm doing score wise over things like cost and reliability and operational excellence. And I can actually go down and see the individual elements. So I can see cost, security, reliability, and just work out what I should be really focusing on. So I can click on these. Just gives, as a customer, an idea of how I'm doing, maybe where I should kind of focus my attention. So that's kind of the, the goal of that new advisor score. There are new Azure Stack capabilities. So there's actually new types of edge. There's this mini R, it's like seven pounds, it's the size of a book, and it's got battery on it. So a, a very small form factor, stick it in your backpack. Uh, and the Pro 4, the Pro 4s have kind of like their GPU capabilities. So just new SKUs of Azure Stack Edge. And as I mentioned, GPU support now in both Hub, so I can get those NVIDIA um, cores, etc., and in the Edge Pro. Windows Virtual Desktop had a, a ton of features. One I've talked about a lot of times before is the Teams redirect. Teams, the audio and video don't work very well when I have a virtual machine in the cloud, so there's a big latency of that audio and video. 
So what the Teams redirect does, instead of going up via the virtual machine, the audio and video go direct from my local client over to the target. So it removes kind of that pain. So that's now simpler to deploy. Um, Microsoft Endpoint Manager now supports multi-session. So one of the great things about Windows Virtual Desktop is ordinarily a client operating system. So if I have Windows Virtual Desktop, we have the kind of a Windows 10 virtual machine. Well, normally I can only have one person connecting to that thing. With multi-session, it behaves like a server OS. So now I can have multiple users, so I can do a depth-based scaling, connecting to the same virtual machine, and it's doing kind of an isolated space for each of them. But it just enables me to maximize the usage of kind of those machines. So now I can do that Microsoft Endpoint Management for multi-session Windows 10, and that is only available actually in uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. So there were a lot of changes there. Um, also, there's an Azure Monitor Workbook now for easier insight into my environment. And MSIX Attached. MSIX Attached is super, super cool. If I think about getting applications to my environment, we've had different solutions in the past. I could install it into the OS, or the OS gets really ugly really quick. We had things like AppV. AppV would kind of stream the application into the OS and cache it on demand. What MSIX Attached does is basically I have these virtual hard disks with one or more apps in it. And what I do is I essentially just attach that to the VM. And when I do that attachment, now those apps are visible in the VM and usable. That's it. This is kind of the, the, the new goal around making apps easily available. So this MSIX app attach, um, now is integrated with the portal. So in the portal, I can say, hey, this attached to these virtual machines, and they'll now be available. Uh, Azure Security Center's had some rebranding. So when before we had like free and standard, what they've now changed that to is all of the threat protection components that were there in the past, if we actually go and look, are now just called Azure Defender. So now if I edit my plan, I'll see Azure Defender on or Azure Defender off. It's not really changing anything around pricing or anything else. It's just a rebranding. So all of those threat protection services we saw in the past is now Azure Defender. And I can turn those on or off, and I can select which kind of sub-components I want to use down here in the bottom, uh, really like I always could. But just that's kind of been um, rebranded. There's also now Azure Defender for Azure Key Vault, a uh, very useful thing. Is there an Azure private marketplace? So I'm sure we're all used to the marketplace. If we go and look and we just search for market, there's a slew of different things uh, available in there from all different kind of publishers. So what the private marketplace does here, you can kind of see it showing up here in the top left, I have this preview option. Now there's a special RBAC role I have to give to the user, but if I do that, if I have that uh, marketplace admin role it's talking about down here, I can hit get started. And now I can add offerings into this private marketplace usable by my company. All of the Microsoft apps are automatically added into that. But it's really just a way that, hey, um, I can now set a curated set of services that I want people to be able to use in my company. And wow, uh, that, that was it. So again, I tried to cover all the big ones that I saw. I hope this was useful. Check out that Ignite book of news. If you can, um, please support the Help Cure Childhood Cancer. Again, it'll be two weeks and I'll report back on how tired I am. In fact, I'll be recording this in two weeks. Probably not been able to stand up. Um, but until next week, uh, take care.